is a sort of a brief introduction to adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so, this is a, a brief outline. So, I'll first sort of re remind you, well, first of all, exactly what adaptive mesh refinement is, um, why do we need it, um, in particular for, for general relativity. So, we'll look at the classes of problems that we're interested in um, and why that um, suggests that something like adaptive mesh refinement is useful or, or effectively essential. And also looking at the properties of the field equations to sort of dictate the characteristics in the particular flavor of adaptive mesh refinement that, we, um, that we'll uh, use. Um, and then in, in sort of after going over this, um, I'm not going to give sort of a survey of all the various kinds of mesh refinement algorithms out there, but the one that, um, that I use and I think is really very well uh, suited towards these kinds of problems is sort of Berger and Oliger style adaptive mesh refinement. Um, and it's Again, it's ideal for you know, hyperbolic wave-like equations and certain classes of problems in GR. Um, and also with certain extensions that I'll sort of very cartoonishly describe. Um, I won't go into the details. It could also be extended to couple hyperbolic elliptic systems like the kind we get when you uh, do a constrained evolution in GR or with certain elliptic gauge conditions. And then just to sort of give an example of this, I'll, I'll uh, show a few slides of uh, critical phenomena in gravitational collapse. Um, it's sort of a kind of interesting sort of theoretical uh, uh, subject in GR. It probably doesn't have much astrophysical significance, but it's sort of an interesting topic. And it's a, in some sense, it's almost a poster child for this Berger and Oliger style AMR. It was sort of this, this was essential for the, the discovery of critical phenomena by Choptwick a few years ago. Um, and it works exceedingly well in those situations. Um, ne next lecture, which is going to be on Friday, I'll show some examples of uh, binary black hole space times where this is also very, very useful for. Then I'll just spend a, a few slides just describing this PAMR, AMRD infrastructure, um, PAMR, parallel adaptive mesh refinement, AMRD, uh, adaptive mesh refinement driver um, that, that I use for the, the 3D code. So the, 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 the critical examples that I'll show you are in axisymmetry, and they were sort of done with just a uh, a non-parallel code, but with a style of Bergen Oliger AMR. Um, and then for, for the, the binary evolutions, you need parallel computation. So this is where the, so the motivation for writing these parallel libraries. I'll, so today I'm just going to sort of briefly sort of introduce this, and I'll perhaps give a, an example of, the, of how you use these libraries um, on Friday. Okay, so first of all, just, just basically about, you know, a few comments on adaptive mesh refinement. So adaptive mesh refinement, the name is very descriptive. Um, so you can sort of, if, if you don't know what it is, you can sort of guess what it is. I mean, um, and it's really a technique that makes solving certain classes of partial differential equations or discrete partial differential equations um, efficient uh, for certain classes of problems. And in particular, um, this kind of adaptive mesh refinement is useful if there's a wide range of relevant length scales that you need to resolve in the computational domain. Um, However, the smallest length scales in the problem are not volume filling. So, so for example, if you were in a situation where you wanted to study turbulence, and it, I mean, the, this kind of mesh refinement is not really going to help you in that situation, because that's a, volu a volume filling feature. Um, here, for, say for example, a binary black hole space time, uh, where the smallest length scales are the black holes, and it's a binary system, there are only two small length scales. Um, in that case, it's not volume filling, and so this kind of mesh refinement um, is, is useful. Um, the part where the adaptivity comes in or is useful is if you don't necessarily know where those small length scale features are going to form. Um, for example, in some of the cosmological simulations that um, uh, Mike does. Um, or you don't know where they're going to be going, for instance, in a binary black hole evolution. So having some kind of automatic adaptivity where you don't... Um, have to prescribe where you're going to need the fine resolution is a useful feature uh, in, in, in this algorithm. And then the third point where this, the third sort of point is why you'd want to use something like this is if it's computationally too expensive to solve the full problem on a uniform mesh. Um, and so incidentally, I want to sort of emphasize in that you know, mesh refinement is not a method that's going to give you better accuracy, for example, compared to a unigrid evolution if you, could have, if you had enough computational resources just to solve it on a uniform grid. 
In fact, it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite. In mesh refinements, you sort of, you're just putting resolution exactly where you need it to save on computational uh, costs. And so compared to, for example, uh, a mesh refinement, uh, a solution that you'll get with mesh refinement, uh, compared to one that you get if, if you could do a uniform evolution uh, with a resolution the same as the finest resolution in the, in the AMR hierarchy, it'll always, the unigrid evolution will always be much more accurate than the mesh refinement one. Um, in addition, a problem with mesh refinement is generically with these algorithms, um, at refinement interfaces, you're going to get, you know, quotes, noise. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, real noise. I mean, these are sort of, if you, at the discrete level of the equations, there are, you know, features in the discrete equations which are going to produce, um, you know, solution features there. For example, there's sort of, there'll be an impedance in this message, if you will, uh, for waves propagating across these fine refinement boundaries. And so there could be some artificial reflections of refinement boundaries and things like that. And even though, you know, you, typically they'll be quite small and all the noise, the level will be quite low. And you can work, you know, there's a lot of work that you can do to actually get the level down to um, where it's not really going to affect your simulations. Um, that aspect of the problem makes it very, very challenging with the mesh refinement algorithm to really get a, a high accuracy solution. And so perhaps the, you want to perhaps think then of mesh refinement as a tool simply to get an answer um, in the first place to, to some problem which is computationally impossible if you didn't have this, this kind of um, uh, technology. Um, and it, once you've got an answer, then you can try to be a bit clever and see, well, okay, if we do really need some aspect of the solution to very high accuracy, um, you can work on ways to try to improve that. And perhaps this, this critical phenomena that I'll show you is a really good, <coughs> a, a good example of that, um, where you, know, you, you sort of do the discovery with this mesh refinement because it enables you to actually solve the equations in those situations. And then when you understand what, what, what's the, uh, what you've actually found, you can adapt the problem um, and choose computational techniques that, that perhaps don't uh, necessarily need a mesh refinement. Okay, so let's just, so we went over this a little bit in lecture one, but let's review just briefly why um, this is beneficial for at least certain class of problems in GR. <clears throat> and so thinking of, you know, astrophysical scenarios, or scenarios of interest, so gravitational collapse, uh, binary black hole mergers. <clears throat> Um, we have a rel it's not, not a huge range of length scales, but there are a lot, uh, several orders of magnitude of relevant length scales that need to be resolved. So we have the smallest um, uh, length scale, which is the compact object radius. <coughs> so roughly at the, the gravitational radius, the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. Um, then there's going to be the, the sort of the near zone where the interesting dynamics is going to happen, save with a binary black hole spacetime. And that's going to be or, of order tens of gravitational radii. Um, and then again, if you really want to extract the gravitational waves or features or you know, understand properties of the solution in a way which isn't um, entangled with all the issues of coordinates, etc., you have to be sufficiently far away that you're in the weak field regime and you can understand um, the gravitational waves that are emitted. And that's typically you know, hundreds of gravitational radii away. So we have these relevant, these range of length scales that need to be resolved. However, in the strong field regime in particular, uh, the, these length scales are not volume filling. As I mentioned before, you've got one black hole, you've got two black holes. They pretty much stay where they are. You're not going to generate small length scale features um, away from, uh, from the black holes. Incidentally, though, this, this is not always the case in general relativity, in particular for, for any, any class of, or theory or class of PDEs, it's not necessarily this, that um, something like mesh refinement will always work. It's, al it's also the kind of problem that you're looking at. For example, in um, the study of cosmological singularities in GR, where you get this chaotic mix master type behavior, um, the, the, the interesting things that develop in those solutions are volume filling. It's not something that's isolated at a, at a couple of points. Um, the other property of the, of the solutions of the field equations for, for black holes and uh, gravitational collapse is that, again, in the strong field regime, the temporal scales are essentially uh, equivalent to the, the, uh, the spatial length scale. So in these geometric units, you know, they, they have the same units. And typically, if you have a small length scale feature that 
that develops a place where gravitational collapse is happening or where the black holes are moving. The, the, the time scale on which the solution changes is going to be exactly the same. So in some sense, where, where you have a small length scale feature, you're also going to have a small temporal uh, scale feature that needs to be resolved. Um, so why, so, so this is sort of ideal for you know, mesh, having some kind of mesh refinement where you can put resolution where you need it. Um, and then the adaptivity is important um, because of the nonlinearity of the field equations, in the sense you can't really predict where interesting things are going to happen, either where the black holes are going to move or, um, I'll show an example with a critical collapse, where the collapse is going to happen um, until you've actually solved the equations. In certain situations, you can. Um, so it's not always that you need adaptivity, but in general, um, it's very useful. And, and incidentally, if you, the, the machinery for doing something like a Bergen algorithm um, Having an adaptive type of mesh versus a static mesh, it's not computationally that much more complicated. So if you're ever going to be, well, if you're using a package, I mean, that you don't really have to worry about that. But if you're ever going to be writing your own software, sort of consider from the beginning to, um, to consider um, adaptivity because it's really almost, you can almost get it for free if you write things properly. Um, yeah, and I think maximum speed of propagation is the speed of light here. We don't have to worry about things moving faster than that. Um, and that's just, you know, with a, this, this point that temporal scales and length scales are commensurate, and we know that the maximum speed of propagation is, is, is one. It's in some sense, it limits how small uh, features can, can develop in this for, for binary black holes. Actually, with critical phenomena, things, things get more complicated, as I'll show. Now, now one, one property of general relativity, which is not going to fit well in this framework, is in the weak field regime for the gravitational waves that are emitted by the binary. So we have these black holes orbiting each other. They're starting to emit gravitational waves. These waves are going to propagate outwards in these sort of spherical-like shells. And of course, that's going to be volume filling. Very soon after this, these binaries start generating the waves, you're going to get these, this wave train uh, filling all of space. Um, and so if so that's, that's an aspect of the problem that mesh refinement is not going to help with. Um, you're not going to be able, if you really want the waves with exquisitely high accuracy, you're going to have to do something different. Um, however, and again, we will, so on the next lecture, I'll show you some example of, of examples of black hole uh, mergers. Um, and it's really, in some ways, the strong field dynamics is the important thing in sourcing these gravitational waves. And you don't really need that much accuracy in propagating them away from the, from the, uh, the solution. OK, so, so all of those features suggest that um, you know, mesh refinement is going to be helpful, useful for these uh, kinds of, uh, for GR. But what, what particular aspects of an algorithm are important and are what are not important? Um, well, well, first of all, again, I'm sorry, I'm not like surveying all the literature on mesh refinement, but um, some of you might know there are some algorithms that have very sophisticated data structures that can, um, for example, have, represent very complicated shapes. I mean, the, the, the meshes can actually sort of, conf um, sort of can adapt to the shapes of the, the objects that you're refining. Um, however, in, in GR, in particular, because we've only got sort of a couple of and sort of two length scales at most, if you want to look at the binary black hole problem, we really don't need sophisticated uh, clustering and grid structuring algorithms. And it turns out that sort of simple aligned like box in box mesh refinement is, is perfectly adequate. Um, incidentally, if these sort of words are a little bit confusing, I'll, I'll sort of give more of a graphic illustration of this, this later. So hopefully it'll, um, it'll become clearer in, in a little bit. So we don't really need very sophisticated clustering algorithms. We don't need a very sophisticated grid hierarchy. Um, so we can sort of get away with the relatively simple, uh, simple data structures. On the other hand, um, adaptivity is important because we don't necessarily know where these things are, are, are going to move. So we do need the adaptivity. And for, for efficiency, because the temporal length scales are commensurate with the spatial length scales, it really helps to have uh, what's called time subcycling, or essentially what you want to do is you want to have the same uh, CFL factor at every level in the hierarchy. Um, that's not, of course, it's not essential, but the, the idea with mesh refinement is to get um, 
a huge speed up by not over resolving certain parts of the solution. Um, and if you don't do this tubs, time sub cycling, essentially over, over resolving in time certain aspect, uh, certain regions of the domain, which is not necessary. Um, so uh, then just to rephrase what I said, you know, adaptive mesh refinement by itself, and now this is regardless of how complicated you try to make the, the algorithm, is not going to help track with gravitational wave emission because it is a volume filling feature. It's not something where you can just put little bits of resolution on, say, in the troughs of the waves or on the wave fronts. I mean, that, that it doesn't work like that. These are volume filling features. Um, and in, if, if that, is, that does become an issue, if you really need the waves to exquisitely high accuracy, you really, you're going to have to use a different method. And for example, with, um, in GR, there are a couple of obvious um, suggestions, even though it's not necessarily e easy, would be to change the coordinates to something where the waves are more efficiently re represented. So um, when, when the binaries sort of spiral, they're going to emit these waves, but it's got a relatively simple multipolar structure. So for example, on the simulation, um, in, the, in the strong field regime, Cartesian-like coordinates are, the, are so the, very efficient at representing the, the binaries, but they aren't uh, efficient at representing low multiple spherical harmonics. So changing to a spherical polar type coordinate system far from the binaries, that will be a way to uh, get higher accuracy with reasonable cost. And another thing um, that's, that some people are working on and it's been suggested is sort of to, as, you, as the waves start to propagate outwards, either at some point transform to a null code where the waves can sort of immediately propagate to infinity or start to bend the slice. So it's, you, usually we think of having a space-like slice, but you can sort of bend the slice and make it asymptotically null. And in that way, you'll be able to propagate the waves out to large distances efficiently. But the, these issues are not really related to mesh refinement at all. In some sense, it's just the nature of the problem is telling you that mesh refinement is not, a, not going to be efficient uh, for those problems. So with all of these, of these uh, um, implications, or what, they, what they suggest is that this Berglin algorithm, um, the sort of a simplified version of it, will be, is adequate for the problem. Um, though, as I'll describe a little bit, we've had to make some sort of extensions to the algorithm to deal with elliptics. The original Bergen algorithm was just designed for uh, hyperbolic type equations. Okay, so, so what specifically is Bergen and algorithm adaptive mesh refinement? Um, and incidentally, so the details are in, um, so you can read the original paper, but so the details of this particular variant um, and in particular, the details of how you handle the elliptics is in this, this article. So with, with, with Berglund Olger adaptive mesh refinement, you take your computational domain and you cover it with this hierarchy of sort of independent uh, rectangular uniform meshes. Um, so, so for example, let's say this, this is your entire computational domain. This is an example with sort of three levels. So for whatever, this is just some, you know, just some made up structure, but say you needed more resolution there and there. And so where you need more resolution, you put finer meshes. But th these meshes are internally, they are just uniform rectangular meshes. So for example, this is your hierarchy. This is, this is your single computational domain. This is where you need the resolution. But the way in which you'll actually represent this structure in memory is as I said, in this case, three sort of distinct levels. Uh, where each level, the meshes in that level have the same uh, uniform uh, resolution. And at each, so at each level, there'll be a set of distinct uh, rectangular meshes in memory. Uh, so for example, say, take a point over there. That point is going to be represented at three different memory locations. Um, it, it might sort of seem redundant, but actually, if you, if you think, in the end, if you sort of think about the computational cost, um, involved for keeping, for sort of having a little bit of redundancy, it's really irrelevant. And in particular, the, the advantage of this kind of structure is that it becomes incredibly easy to take some unigrid code that you've worked on and fit it into this adaptive mesh refinement structure. Um, we'll sort of see that a little bit later, but essentially what it means is that you can write a unigrid code, you can test it, you can make it work. And with almost no effort then, it can be incorporated into sort of a, 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 an AMR driver um, without having to worry about details of how to represent these, these, these hierarchies. 
So some restrictions on, on the, the, the kind of way in which these grids have to be aligned. And so, so, um, so these are rectangular uniform meshes. So the, we call sort of the child meshes are the ones that are gonna have higher resolution. So this, for example, this is a, the, the parent grid and there's three child grids. Um, so we're gonna require that they are entirely contained, all the child grids are entirely contained within all the parent grids um, and that they're aligned with, uh, uh, with parent uh, grid boundaries. So th this is one simplification from the original Bergen algor algorithm where they al allowed these child meshes to be rotated at some arbitrary angle relative to the parent meshes. And I guess the, like one of the example problems that they were looking at was sort of wave propagation or the propagation of some pulse. And if that, that pulse was sort of propagating at some oblique angle relative to the grid, uh, it was sort of more efficient to have you know, the, the, the mesh representing that rotated. Um, however, I think the in, again, in the, the, sort of the complexity that that adds to the algorithm is probably not worth um, um, sort of worth worrying about given that the, the, the speed up that you might get for sort of slightly micromanaging uh, the alignments to get a little bit um, more efficiency um, is probably not worth it. So, so the, this sort of simplifies things and makes it much more easier to, uh, to program. Okay, so this, this is how you represent your, your computational domain. Uh, the second important part of the algorithm is this recursive time stepping procedure. And this, then, all the so called time subcycling, where you not only are refining in space, so this sort of example shows just one sort of t equals constant slice of the hierarchy. But the way in which you're going to evolve these meshes in time, you're actually taking this sort of temporal refinement. Uh, uh, you, you, you sort of are, you are refining essentially in time. And again, I'll, if, if this is all sort of confusing words, I think I'll, I'll sort of try and illustrate it with, with pictures in a little bit, and that will hopefully uh, clarify these things. So with this uh, recursive time-stepping algorithm, what you do um, is you take a single sort of a unigrid time-step on a parent level before you take uh, a set of time-steps on the, the child level. And the number of steps that you take is this called this temporal refinement ratio. And again, I mentioned it's, it's useful to keep the same CFL uh, uh, factor. So for example, if you have a two to one spatial refinement ratio, um, if you then have a two to one temporal refinement ratio, both parent and child grid will have the same uh, CFL factor. So for example, what this says is, so this is your hierarchy. You take one step on this parent level, then you take two steps on the child level. And after two steps on the child level, they'll be in sync, but you do it recursively. So one reason why you do it in this particular order is um, if you take the, the step on the parent level first, then you can use uh, the, the solution that you obtained on the parent level to set boundary conditions on the child uh, grids. Because um, if, if you think of this, these are sort of being implemented as individual, separate, distinct unigrid evolutions. When, when you specify the problem, so this is the differential equations that you want to solve, these, this is the boundary of the domain. This is where you specify boundary conditions. These aren't boundaries that, in any sense of the word. So when you're evolving this grid, which is not um, adjacent to any physical boundary, what boundary condition do you place there? Well, you can place a boundary condition. It's not a boundary of the problem. And so by taking, by sort of solving, the, having a solution on the parent domain first, allows you to do with temporal interp or interpolating in time to place boundary conditions on these child meshes. Okay. As you've mentioned, there are, there are, in particular, if you don't worry about elliptics or if you have an explicit time integration, there are alternative schemes where you don't necessarily have to follow this ordering. For example, these tapered boundary methods where you know, after doing several steps on the child mesh, you'll essentially throw away uh, sort of the, the region of the boundary um, that's sort of the size of, of the, the numerical speed of propagation, but sort of using interpolation is sort of a more generic algorithm and it works with, with elliptics. Um, so, and again, as, as I mentioned before, the, the other nice feature of this Bruggen-Olga style mesh refinement with this particular recursive time subcycling 
is it's really, it allows you to implement this AMR technology essentially independently of the details of the, of the Unigrid evolution. And conversely, the, if you're writing the Unigrid code, you really don't have to worry about these aspects of the mesh refinement. All you have to worry about is how you take a single time step on one of these Unigrid meshes. Um, the only thing that you have to, that you might have to worry about that's different than if you sort of wrote a single Unigrid evolution scheme is on some grids, you might not have a physical boundary at that location. It might be an internal refinement boundary. And actually in that case, so the, the only thing that you have to do then is if you had one of these internal refinement boundaries, you just don't do anything. You just ignore those points. The, the algorithm will take care of it for you. Okay, so, so one of these sort of one sub-step in this recursive stepping algorithm, you take one unit grid time step, you take a row, row sub t uh, fine grid time steps. And then after they're in sync again, you inject the solution back from the child grid to the parent grid. So in, in that way, you always have the most accurate solution at all levels in the hierarchy. That, um, um, or you, you sort of propagate the most accurate solution to all levels of the hierarchy. Um, so when, in some sense, at intermediate stages, you know, the, the, the levels are going to be at different times and they might have different values. But after sort of one full time step, when, when all these levels are in sync again, you're going to have a, um, a single valued solution on your computational domain. Um, the other sort of is the advantage of you know, having a recursive time stepping, as I mentioned, is if you, know, if you have an optimal solution strategy, you're essentially going to get an optimal solution in terms of the computational time. So I'm saying you're order n. So if n are your number of points in space time, um, the fastest way you could sort of imagine to solve the problem is in order n uh, flops, essentially, some constant times a number of points. Um, and with this time, with this recursive time stepping strategy, you can sort of get at least close to optimal. The other important feature, so this is sort of now where the adaptivity comes in, um, is that the, the algorithm provides a mechanism um, to determine how the hierarchy is going to change in time using truncation error estimates. And so, and, and essentially, um, essentially what you do is you do little sort of the, the Richardson extrapolations. And so for the original Bergen algorithm proposal was, so at some point you want to say, well, do we have to regrid? Has some, has some feature moved uh, in the computational domain? Now we have to shift the grids to track this feature. And the way that you do this in a way that's sort of automatic, that's independent of the, the kind of equations that you're uh, solving. So the algorithm, for this to really be automatic, the algorithm can't know what you think are interesting features. And the way that it can do that is with the, the Richardson expansion. So what you do is you give the algorithm some uh, threshold truncation error level. And you, you say you want the solution more accurate than this truncation level over the entire domain. So periodically, what you would then do is you'd say you'd make, you'd take the hierarchy, you'd make a copy of it, coarsen it by say some two to one refinement ratio, and evolve these two levels, um, say one step on the coarse level, two steps on the fine level, so to the same physical time, you'd subtract the solution, and then by the Richardson expansion, that's gonna be an estimate of the truncation error in that solution. And then based on if there are certain regions of that truncation error which is above the threshold, you say, okay, we're gonna to have to refine that region. Or conversely, if at some point the, the truncation error drops below the threshold, you can get rid of grids, you can unrefine. So, sort of one sort of, um, I think, slight sort of simplification of this idea of like periodically making a copy of the hierarchy and doing these different evolution steps is if you look at the way in which this recursive time stepping works, um, there are certain places in essentially just before the injection phase, this truncation error estimate is sort of automatically available. You don't really need to do anything extra. You can automatically uh, compute the truncation error estimates. And again, in the, in the example that I'll show, I'll sort of explicitly point out where you can do that. And so you don't really need to have any extra machinery to duplicate the hierarchy and make comparisons between levels. The only thing that you have to do to sort of start or bootstrap this, this sort of self-shadow hierarchy a method of producing trunc uh, this truncation error estimates is make sure that your coarsest level is fully refined. So if your coarsest level is fully refined, so you always have two levels in the hierarchy, your, your coarsest level and your next coarsest level. 
And then you can always, so you always have two re resolutions to computer truncation error estimate. And that, if you're thinking about it, that doesn't really add any additional cost to the computation because you will just sort of choose your base resolution to be such that your first refined level is the resolution that you want for the, your, your courses level. Okay, so I just want to make a few comments on, on extending this into, to incorporate elliptics. And I don't want to go into the details of this because the details are a little bit tricky, but um, just, just sort of the, the, the ideas behind it. And so for, for hyperbolic equations, um, so, so we take one step on a course level and then we take little steps on the fine levels and it's the fine levels which have resolved the features in the interior. Now, as in, in many of the lectures, you, we've sort of um, described that in, with, with these finite difference techniques, of essentially any numerical technique, um, if you under-resolve a feature, if you don't have enough grid points covering a wavelength, um, the numerical scheme is going to be dominated by truncation error. In other words, the wave speeds, uh, the phase speeds are going to be completely wrong. The amplitude evolution is going to be completely wrong. So in particular, when you're taking this step on a course level, that interior part of the domain which is under-resolved is going to be completely wrong, the evolution. However, if you have hyperbolic equations, it doesn't really matter. You're sort of going to get that interior bit completely wrong. It's going to start to sort of propagate out, and it will want to pollute the rest of the domain. But almost immediately afterwards, you're going to inject um, the fine resolution solution over that region that was incorrectly evolved. So because of the hyperbolic, the, the finite speed of propagation of hyperbolic equations, it doesn't matter that you're under-resolving things on the coarse grid because after one step on the coarse grid, you're continually going to be sort of getting rid of that solution with a fine resolution, the fine grid solution, which was adequately resolved on the fine grid, presumably, and it's going to have the correct solution. On the other hand, if you think if you've got sort of some elliptic equations that, that you also want to solve at the same time, that doesn't work at all. In particular, if it's sort of sources um, in the interior, so for example, um, energy density in the interior, which is also sourcing the elliptic, it's not just a, a homogeneous sort of boundary problem, then if you poorly resolve things in the interior, you're going to globally change the solution. And you don't want that. That's a, that, that's a really very a bad idea for elliptics. So essentially, the, the way that you can sort of modify things to actually get them into the algorithm is you, you sort of you change the, the, the place where you solve the elliptics versus where you solve the hyperbolics. And essentially, if you, th if you think of this recursive algorithm as sort of you're traversing sort of a tree, tree structure, um, when you descend this tree in the recursive time-stepping algorithm, that's where you solve the hyperbolics. At that stage, you don't solve the elliptic equations, but you use sort of an as a sort of a temporary step, you use an extrapolated solution for those elliptic variables from past time levels. So for example, you take a core step, you'll solve the hyperbolics, you won't solve the elliptic, you'll extrapolate them from solutions from past time levels. Um, but then when you ascend the, the tree, so, it, so from the hyperbolic equations point of view, so you, you go down, you go to the coarsest level, you solve the equations, and then you start propagating that solution up. You start injecting it up from the coarsest to the fine level. And at that point, when you have those fine grid information available, then you resolve the elliptics over essentially entire sub-hierarchies um, of, the, of the domain at the same time. And in that way, whenever you solve the elliptic equations, you've always got all of the information on the finest levels available. OK, so, so, so that might have been a little bit confusing with a lot of uh, new words and jargon. So perhaps this, this example might uh, clarify, will hopefully clarify things a bit. This is an example where, so this is sort of like a two-dimensional grid. So this is our initial hierarchy. We have some wave that's going to be propagating. Um, and initially, we've got this, this, this domain covered with two levels. So this is the, the parent level. This is the child level. We have a two-to-one refinement ratio. You can see a higher resolution in the interior. And we're also going to have a two-to-one temporal refinement ratio. So this, this is sort of going to be space. And then we're going to be evolving this grid in time using this Berglund algorithm. So initially, we, however you produce the initial hierarchy, um, we say that the, this, is the, this is adequate to represent this, this feature. So now with the Berglund algorithm, um, 
we're going to first take a step on, this, on the parent level, and then we're going to take two steps on the, on the child level. So, so we take one step on the, on the parent level. Um, if these are only hyperbolic equations, it's just the usual algorithm. We evolve uh, the, the, the solution to this level. And you can see that this, this thing is completely underrepresented there. Again, the solution there might be completely garbage, but it's not going to propagate out to the boundaries um, in one time step. If we had elliptic equations, we wouldn't actually solve it on this hierarchy. We'd have just extrapolated the solution to this, to this uh, time level. But now we're going to take a couple of time steps on the, the, the fine mesh. So on the first mesh, um, so now we took one time step. The temporal refinement ratio is 2 to 1, so we just go to half the time step. Um, the boundary conditions, again, for this, so this, this is a physical boundary, so you'd place physical boundary conditions there. But these are interior refinement boundaries, and so the boundary condition would be placed by sort of interpolating the solution in time from uh, the parent level onto the, the child level. If we did have elliptic equations at this stage, we would solve the elliptics over this subdomain of the hierarchy using extrapolated boundary conditions. Okay, so we take one more step to repeat the algorithm, but now these two levels are in sync again. However, at this, at this stage, just before the injection, um, so, uh, so as I sort of try to explicitly show, the, the, the solutions are not going to be the same. Um, we, we've, we've evolved on the, on the coarse level, you know, using a much coarser layer, uh, uh, discretization. So the difference here is going to be related to the truncation error. So at this stage, just before you inject the solution from um, the, the child to the parent mesh, you can compute the truncation error. You can subtract them and get an estimate of the truncation error. So, at the, so you do that at this stage and you save that, but now we're going to inject. So we inject the solution from, the, um, from level 2 to 1, and so now again we have a, a single valued solution over the entire mesh. Um, again, the, 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 um, the coarse parent mesh covers the whole domain, but now it's single valued. But now at this stage, so just before we did the injection, we computed the truncation, an estimate of the truncation error, and let's supposedly we decided, okay, we didn't have enough resolution there. So now we want to add a new fine level. So this next stage, we're going to, we're going to regrid, and we're going to add a new, a new fine level. So now we've got three levels in the hierarchy, and so, so you, you initialize the data on this, this fine level with some, uh, usually with some polynomial interpolation. So now we have three levels in the hierarchy, and let's just, uh, just to, I guess with two levels, the recursive nature is perhaps not that obvious. So we just do one more time step with the three levels so you can see how uh, the, the recursive nature of the algorithm works. Okay, so one time step on the, cor on the coarsest level. Again, ex ex extrapolate the elliptics. Now we start to descend this uh, sort of the mesh structure. We take one time step on level two. But now we don't take the second step on level two yet. Now we again go down, and now we take a couple of steps on level three. Right? So we take one step on level three, the next one. Again, here if you wanted, we can you know, compute truncation errors and see, well, do we actually want to add another level of refinement? Um, but we won't here, so we'll inject the solution. Now we'll sort of go back up the, the, this, this recursive tree and take the second step on level two, inject the solution, take two more steps on level three and inject the solution. And if we, were, if we had elliptic equations at this point, we'd resolve the elliptics over the, the entire hierarchy. So, so that, would, that would be with a, with a truncation error estimate. So, so for example, I, uh, whoops, I, didn't, I didn't show that, that here, but let's say, let's go back here. So, so at, at this point, so presumably the, there are a couple of assumptions that you sort of make with, with these kinds of algorithms, but the, the initial hierarchy, so you have, you have some number for the truncation error, and presumably on this initial hierarchy, it is everywhere smaller than that. So this is a pretty good representation of the solution everywhere. But things are changing, they're moving by a bit. But you don't expect that suddenly, it, like the, there's going to be a huge error everywhere in the domain. So that the error could move a little bit or it can grow slowly in time. And so, for example, in, in this situation, we're assuming that, say, say this was gravitational collapse, this, is, this length scale is contracting a bit. So the truncation error 
at this resolution is growing. And now say at this point, here in this interior region, um, it goes above the threshold. So what, what you typically do then, so you, you compute the truncation error over this, this domain, so it'll be, you'll have a, a mesh, a grid with a truncation error. You'll sort of tag that this region, it's now above the threshold. You'll then typically put a little buffer zone around that. And the, the size of that buffer zone is usually, depends on how frequently you regrid versus the causal speed of propagation. So, you know, if, if, if features can move at a certain speed, um, you, don't, you don't want to regrid every single time step because regridding introduces you know, noise. And if you regrid it every single time step, you get little, your simulation could be dominated by noise. So you want, so you want a certain time interval between regridding. And the buffer zone that you put is usually so that if a feature is moving as fast as it possibly could, it's not going to go outside that, that fine level um, between regrids. So in this example, what sort of I've assumed, let's say there was a, you know, at this point, the truncation error went above threshold. So we add this little buffer zone, and then we introduce a grid that's entirely uh, surrounding that region of, of high truncation error. Okay. Okay. So, so this, so you can sort of think of this as being, you know, the, the, the bergen oliger hierarchy in space and time. And perhaps just from this picture alone, you can sort of see the kind of speed up you might be able to get with, with an AMR algorithm versus a unigrid evolution. Like, so let, let's say we solve this problem uh, at the resolution of the finest level in the AMR hierarchy at this level. Of course, with the same CFL factor, you'd have you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, this, th this level, you'd essentially fill the space time with points. And so the computational cost with these kinds of algorithms, if you have an efficient, efficient algorithm, is going to be directly proportional to the number of points in space-time. So here, in some sense, the speed up we're getting is, a, is sort of indicated by how sparse this, this, this structure is in space-time. And just to sort of give you like an order of magnitude calculation, just to see what kind of speed up you might expect, let's just imagine we have a sort of a d plus one dimensional evolution. So in the previous, example, there was a, a two plus one, so a three-dimensional space-time simulation, two space plus one time. <clears throat> Let's imagine that the coarsest level has n points in each linear dimension, so there are n to the d points on one grid in the coarsest level. Let's say a two-to-one spatial and temporal refinement ratio, like in that example. And let's imagine that we have a total of capital L levels of refinement. So L equals one is the coarsest all the way up to L equals L, capital L for the finest level. And just for argument's sake, let's take n steps on the, the coarsest level. So in, you know, in a typical simulation, that's roughly of how many steps you may. It might be 10 times n or 100 times n, but it's not going to be something like, usually it's not going to be something like n squared on the temporal steps. So let's just, for argument's sake, we take n steps on the coarsest level. Um, if we keep the same CFL factor, that, that implies that on, on a level L, we're going to take n to the power of 2L times 1 steps. And then just for argument's sake, assume a, a linear filling factor of a half. So each fine mesh, um, the linear dimension is a half. So each child mesh, uh, the linear dimension is half that of the parent level. So, so the area will be a quarter, the volume will be the eighth in 3D, et cetera. And again, let's assume that you know, the runtime is proportional to the total number of grid points. And if you have an optimal solution strategy, that will be the case. And let's ignore the overhead of the AMR algorithm. And for problems in GR, that's, that's, that is a good assumption. Again, the, the, the computation is dominated by sort of the floating point operations trying to solve the field equations at a point. The, the additional overhead that the algorithm introduces, sort of the interpolation, the um, extrapolation, regridding is a, is, a, is a very negligible part of the algorithm. And, and Jim mentioned that as well with, with these kind, the, the, the MHD applications that you, that the, the dominant cost is really in solving the equations at the point. And let's just compare how much time it would take in a, in a hypothetical unigrid run where the entire domain is covered with the grid with the same resolution as the finest AMR um, domain. And so just order of magnitude, we have said, this is some constant of proportionality that measures how, how much it costs to solve the equations effectively at one point. 
Um, for the AMR, we're summing over all these levels. Um, we have n to the d spatial points, again, because the filling factor of a half and assume two to one refinement ratios, every level is the same spatial size. And then we're taking this n times two to the l minus one points. And that's bounded by this number here. Uh, for the unigrid evolution, again, the same computational cost per point. But now the resolution of this, this unigrid is going to be n times 2 to the l minus 1. And then that's raised to the d for the space and then plus 1 for the time. And so if you look at the ratio of the time for the unigrid to the a more, it scales as follows. So 2 to the d times l minus 1, minus 1, whatever. These, these numbers are really not important. Um, the important thing is... Um, is this D times L. So in a sense, every additional level that you get in the, the AMR hierarchy, for example, in a 3D simulation, you're gaining a factor of eight, um, almost an order of magnitude in speed. And so, in, for example, in situations where you might have 10, 20, 30 levels of refinement, I mean, this, this ratio is huge. I mean, you can literally, in certain si situations, get speed ups of you know, millions, billions, etc which tell you that, that you know, doing this thing um, in AMR, you can actually solve it, whereas in Unigrid, it would be a completely po impossible computational task. Of course, the Unigrid solution, if you could have that, would be ridiculously accurate in the course levels of the, the hierarchy compared to the, the AMR uh, grid. But what, what you're saying with, with, this, with this AMR tool is you don't need such high accuracy in the course regions. What you want is you want a given accuracy you know, 1% or something, you know, some measure throughout the domain. You don't care to have uh, exquisitely high accuracy everywhere. So at some level, you might say, okay, this is not a fair comparison, but for, for certain classes of problems, it really is um, um, sort of showing you how much potential there is for this to, to get an uh, efficient solution of the class of equations. Okay, so let, let's, let's look at an example, and this might perhaps be a little breather from numerics, so <laughs> just do, do a bit of, of physics. And so let's look at um, critical phenomena in gravitational collapse. Um, you know, I mean, this was discovered back in 93 by uh, Matt Choptewick, and what it refers to is some sort of interesting behavior that's seen at the threshold of gravitational collapse. And I'll show you in a little bit exactly what I mean by threshold, but essentially if you, um, to, to, to this initial study is in some sense a, study in theoretical GR. So what happens when a gravitational collapse, when black holes start to form? Um, and certainly the, the question that, that, that Matt was trying to answer was, can you form a black hole of an arbitrary small mass from scalar field collapse? Um, and the answer is yes. And for example, if you want to think astrophysics, like can, can you form an arbitrary small mass black hole, you know, when a, a, a the star goes supernova, and the answer is probably no. It's going to be a, a finite-sized black hole generically, and it's going to be large. So this is perhaps a, this is a property of this particular form of matter. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, the answer was yes, is that regardless of the initial size of, the ma of this, this, this distribution of energy, um, and the, the fact that the field equations have no intrinsic length scale, you can nevertheless by finely tuning your initial data, form a black hole of arbitrary small mass. So you can introduce an arbitrary small n scale. But perhaps what was m sort of most surprising about this study, it wasn't really this, this question that he answered, it's what he discovered in the process. And he found that as you try to uh, approach the threshold of black hole formation, the solution becomes, um, you get what is what they call critical phenomenon. Essentially, you get solution in the, in the, the geometry of space-time and this matter field that resembles uh, phase transitions in statistical mechanical systems. So in particular, yeah, the solution approaches a universal solution regardless of the initial conditions. Uh, you get sort of a power law scaling in order of parameters near the threshold solution, and the solution becomes scale invariant in a, in a, a special way. Um, and so since then, you know, people have looked at this in a, quite a range of different kinds of matter fields, and always at threshold there is this kind of critical behavior, and the exact kind depends on the, the type of the system. Um, and as I, I would say perhaps as of today, there's really no clear or obvious astrophysical setting where this might be relevant. And one reason is, is that to actually see this behavior, you really need a fine-tuning mechanism. And for example, in stellar collapse, there doesn't seem to really be a natural fine-tuning mechanism. Um, several years ago, there was a suggestion um, 
by Niemeyer and Jadamsic that um, if there are, if there's a phase transition early on in the universe and primordial black holes could form, in some sense there would be a natural fine tuning mechanism just from the, the, the initial uh, spectrum of fluctuations. Um, but so far there's no, there's no evidence that primordial black holes have formed and so that's not perhaps, um, that, that question's still up in the air. So this is not necessarily astrophysically relevant, but it's sort of an interesting aspect of the, of the field equations. So specifically, what, what happens in, in scalar field critical collapse is that the critical solution, and by solution, I mean both the scalar field and the space-time geometry, um, well, first of all, at threshold, it becomes spherically symmetric. So even if you start with situations where it isn't spherically symmetric, it's gonna to evolve to a spherically symmetric solution and it's gonna become scale invariant in this very particular way. Completely, it's gonna be something that's called discretely self-similar. And just to show you what, what a, a function that's discretely self-similar looks like. Um, so here you've got sort of space and time. Um, so a self-similar function, sort of a continuously self-similar function, I mean, there are many solutions um, in astrophysics where things are at least approximately continuously self-similar. You have some profile and it collapses down essentially maintaining the exact shape. So it's essentially just shrinks down to a point, an accumulation point. A function which is discreetly self-similar also does that. It's got some profile that shrinks down to a point, except there's some, it's modulated by some oscillation in time. In fact, actually in logarithmic time. So there's some oscillation that modulates this self-similar shrinking of the solution. So perhaps, you know, just said, said in words, what, what happens as you approach uh, this threshold solution is that you, you get this, in some sense, this little spherical soliton that forms, and it starts to collapse down to, to, to infinitesimal length scales, but it does so in sort of an echoing fashion, and each sort of echo of the field, um, in, in, the, in the particular case of the scalar field, happens on a scale that's a 30th, um, the size of the previous um, echo, and it takes a 30th the amount of time. Um, so you get this sort of like, like this oscillating solution that collapses down to a point. Um, and as it does so, it exhibits an infinite number of these oscillations, but it collapses to a point in a finite amount of time. So in something, this, this, to, so this using AMR was essential to discover this solution because of this, this collapse down to small length scales. Um, and it's really sort of an ideal problem for Bergel and Oliger, but it's all, and one, one interesting thing about this though is it's, I think one of the rare cases in, in science where um, purely numerical methods were, were, were used to discover something that's completely and qualitatively new in the theory. You know, at, the, at the time when, when Matt was doing these calculations, um, I guess he was sort of criticized for looking at spherically symmetric collapse because it was thought the, uh, everything was known about spherical symmetry in GR. There was nothing new um, in the problem. Uh, and he wouldn't have discovered this if he hadn't used AMR. And this is something, it's not just a detail about the solution. It's something that's qualitatively a new feature of the field equations that arises in this very special situation. So let's just, just explain a little bit more about what I mean by the threshold of black hole formation, in particular with the, with the scalar field. So imagine we've got, you can just think of any distribution of matter. So a scalar field, if you will, is just radiation. So you take a ball of radiation um, and you take a one parameter family of, of balls of radiation and you, you label that, that parameter P. And let's say, for example, let, let, let that, that parameter be the amplitude of, of the, the, the radiation. So if, if, the, if it's a sufficiently small amplitude, so it's a very weak energy density, and you let this thing evolve. So this is a self-gravitating situation. It's just gonna fly apart. Um, you're gonna leave flat space behind. On the other hand, you can imagine if you take a sufficiently dense ball of radiation and sort of focus it towards a point, at some point, you know, the gravity, the self-gravity is gonna be sufficiently strong that you form a black hole. So the threshold of black hole formation is defined as if you have this one parameter fam family of initial data that interpolates between dispersal and black hole formation, the threshold is that critical parameter that's just on the verge of forming a black hole. In other words, you've added just enough energy into this ball uh, of radiation that it's on the verge of forming a black hole. And the way that you study this numerically is you just do a bisection search. So it's a, um, 
sort of a, a relatively simple experiment to do numerically. So let's see, see what happens. So here I've got some, um, this is spherically symmetric initial data, just showing you this, this threshold. And this is actually with an axisymmetric code. But some of the, the, the work that, that we wanted to do this for several years ago was to see. So I mentioned the solution is universal. It doesn't matter what uh, profile you start with. As you approach threshold, approach is this universal solution. And so we wanted to see, well, does that work if you, go, if you have perturbations that are asymmetric? But here, just to demonstrate this, this critical solution, we're just restricting to initially a spherically symmetric initial data. So on, this, on the left here, I've got weak field data. Um, this is an axisymmetric simulation in cylindrical coordinates. So this is the axis of symmetry. Um, this is sort of the z direction, if you will. That's the row direction. Um, what this, this plot is showing, both the color and the, the height of the surface, is the magnitude of the field. So if you sort of imagine spinning this around the axis, this is sort of a, initially a Gaussian spherical pulse of energy. This is actually the weak case, but notice the, the color scale. Just so you can see the late time dynamics, I've stretched this by a large factor compared to the other ones, just so you'll see the wave, the wave nature of the solution. So this is weak field. As you start the evolution, you can see Oops, you can't see. Let me, um, I think I have to do. Try again. Okay, let's try again. So as you start, you see this, this is just a very weak field distribution. It's a pulse of essentially light that implodes to the origin, reflects to the origin and propagates output at the speed of light the amplitude drops off like one over the distance. Uh, now in, the, <clears throat> in the, 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 the large amplitude case, so I've just scaled the axis down, but you can see from the color scale, this is a much larger amplitude. In this case, a black hole is going to form. And here, we don't have excision. Um, and this is, using a, this is also a maximal isotropic type coordinate system, but without excision. And what happens is, um, as the black hole forms, eventually things are just going to slow. The lapse is collapsing down in this region, so things are just going to slow down. I think at about this time, an apparent horizon is formed in this region. So you can see qualitatively a very different outcome from the solution here on the left. So if, if, you, did evolve, if you did start with excision and evolve this um, you know, forever, what would happen is this, the scalar field outside would propagate away. Some would accrete onto the black hole, but you'd form a singularity in the center. That's just the singularity inside the black hole. So now what happens if we tune between, if we do a bisection search between these two cases, you know, searching for that threshold solution, here we've tuned to one part in 10 to the 15, you get this echoing solution. And here I'm just gonna show it in um, sort of coordinate time. So you can see that the scalar field starts to want to collapse. It also starts to want to propagate outwards. But you see this little sort of echoing solution begin. And what you can see in this, in this, uh, in these coordinates is what's happened essentially in the last frame of this animation. There have been two additional echoes of the field. And that's because the time scales are ex sort of, each echo is occurring at a 30th of the time scale before. Um, How much human time you spent on these simulations? Sorry? How much human time elapsed in these simulations? So, so th this, this was back, well, seven, eight years ago. Um, on a PC of that time, and it was about two days, two, three days. So th this one would be a few minutes, this one would be a few minutes, but then as you, as you start, what's actually happening and you're not seeing is that mesh refinement is taking place. I'll show you a little bit later an example of the hierarchy. And so this extreme resolution is needed in that regime to, to get that. So let me just sort of play it again. And so you can see here, there's sort of the first echo of the field. Um, then there's a second one and a third one, essentially in the last time frame. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, in certain situations, you know, if you know what the nature of the solution is, you can sort of adapt the coordinates to it, and you don't necessarily need mesh refinement. This is a good example. Um, so I'm going to now show you this animation where we change to logarithmic coordinates centered on the origin, and you'll see this echoing structure. And this is just a coordinate transformation of this solution, but you could presumably solve the equations on a uniform mesh with those coordinates. If you knew, what you'd need to know is you'd need to know what the accumulation point is, and you'd need to tune that to within one part in 10 to the 15, but you can do that. So this is now that same solution previously 
but I've changed to a logarithmic radial coordinate and just added this little constant so we don't get log of zero. Um, and so you can, you can see this, that this, this is the initial pulse. It looks a little bit weird in these logarithmic coordinates, but this is just so you can see the late time behavior. So, and also what's, what I'm going to happen is I'm going to slow down time as we approach that accumulation point. And so you can see here, you get this, this self-similar echoing solution that's sort of slowly collapsing down to small scales. And, and incidentally, the, 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 the critical solution, or the part of the space-time that's exhibiting the self-similar echo is just that central region at any one point. So it sort of undergoes an echo, it shakes off about 95% of its energy in one echo, and that the, 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 the little ball of energy that's left over continues to collapse. And so these rings that you see are sort of the remnants of the previous echoes that are actually now propagating outwards at the speed of light. Um, the reason why it looks like they're freezing in there is because the time is slowing down so we can follow this, uh, the central echoing region again. So let me just show that again. So, so you see, like, like, so time is slowing down. These are waves that are actually propagating out. They're not part of the critical solution anymore. It's really just this echoing region, which is the threshold solution. So, so that's, that's the, uh, the spherically symmetric solution. So it, it's not, not theoretically. I mean, so what, um, at least there's not a compelling argument why that particular number comes out. Um, because it, this is a massless scalar field, so there's no intrinsic scale either in the field equations or in, in the scalar field. So you'd think, okay, well, then it has to be something of order unity. Well, a 30th, I don't know, that's perhaps stretching a little bit, but no one knows exactly why that particular number. So incidentally, there, there are two numbers that pop out. One is that scale, um, this echoing exponent, so e to the minus um, th this quantity. And then there's this other, the scaling exponent, and that's if you have a near critical solution. Um, so for example, this isn't, th this example isn't exactly the critical solution, it's close to the critical solution, but th th the self-similar collapse stops at a certain length scale. And the scale at which it stops is given by this relation. So, for example, in a case where a black hole forms, um, the mass of the black hole is going to be given by this relation. And this number, gamma, which is 0.37, also pops out of the simulation. And no one really understands why those two numbers are what they are. So it's, it's, sort of, it's, a, really, it's a really interesting thing in which yeah, you have this completely scale-free scale, scale -free equations in the theory, and yet these two universal numbers seem to pop out at this threshold. So the, the, well, the, one of the interesting things is, so the, I guess, um, so this was sort of all you know, serendipitous. He didn't really, he wasn't really looking for this phenomenon and it popped out. But the one question that he was trying to answer then, well, can you form uh, uh, an arbitrary small black hole? And it's because of the scaling, you can. If you just fine tune your initial data sufficiently close to the threshold, you can make a black hole that's arbitrary small. Incidentally, any length scale that arises in the problem is going to have a similar relation. For example, the Ricci scalar um, has a one over length squared dimension, and so it's going to have a relationship of this form. So what you can see here is as you get closer and closer to the threshold, the curvature scalar is, is diverging. And actually, at threshold, you don't have a black hole anymore. It, it doesn't make sense to have a zero mass black hole, but at threshold, um, you get a solution. The critical solution then is going to have diverging curvature at that critical point. There's no event horizon, so this is a naked singularity. And so sort of a funny little side comment about this is at the time, so or a little bit afterwards, um, this discovery actually made it to the New York Times, but not, not because of perhaps the scientific value, but because several years before, so Stephen Hawking and uh, Kip Thorne had made a bet about solutions uh, to the field equations, particularly uh, this cosmic censorship conjecture. So Kip Thorne, if you ever go to Caltech and you walk through the, the tapir walls, I guess tapir's moved now, but he's got all these wages on the wall. So he likes to bet about you know, things, and this was one of the bets. Um, and the, 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 so the, the, I mean, there's this open question in general relativity is, can you have naked singularities? In other words, we know that there are singularities. Are, are they always going to be clothed um, inside the event horizon of a black hole? And sort of Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture. 
And this particular bet that they made, so, so Kip sort of likes the idea that naked singularities might be there. Stephen Hawking did, and, um, and so John Peskel as well with, with, with Kip Thorne. And so the, the particular way in which they formulated the reason why this is such a difficult conjecture to prove is that there are some obvious counterexamples, but they involve certain artificial situations, so it's not something where uh, you might have a, a simple proof. But so they, they sort of quantified this in the way that if you, if you start with... Um, you take some classical field of matter like a scalar field, which if you don't couple it to gravity, it never becomes singular. So a scalar field in flat space, it never, if you start with regular initial data, it will always be regular. Um, it, it can never form a singular state. Of course, when you couple it to gravity now with this gravitational collapse, it can collapse to form a black hole, so it can become singular. But this bet was saying that you'll never form a naked singularity from classical matter that doesn't exhibit singular behavior. And this was an example now which disproved this, this bet. This is an example where you start with classical matter, which never uh, uh, becomes singular. You couple it to gravity. And here, in this case, at the threshold, it becomes singular, and there's no singularity. I'm oh, sorry, there's no event horizon. Um, but you can see that like, so, so Stephen Hawking wasn't quite happy with the words. He said, conceded on a technicality. <laughs> and so the, the technicality was here yeah, that what they didn't quite anticipate, and what they, so they have a new bet now that says, not only does it have to satisfy this property, but it has to be generic. So this solution, this, this naked singular solution, isn't a generic solution. You have to fine tune the initial data to arbitrary precision, to or infinite precision, to actually get this naked singularity. Um, yeah, on it. <laughs> I, pres I presume. So the, this is back in '91. You probably didn't write it. So, well, I. So, so perhaps, perhaps I was sneaky. Perhaps he didn't really want to concede. So <laughs> then he should have missed out concede. <laughs> okay. So just just now, just another well, a couple of examples to show <clears throat> the mesh refinement structure. So, like one of the reasons why we did the, this with the two D code was to test this universality hypothesis. So, so in Matt's original paper, he had, he had uh, shown universality in spherical symmetry. So regardless of the class of initial condition you start with, it could be a Gaussian pulse, it could be a square pulse of energy. The details of the initial conditions are completely washed out as you approach this critical solution. And so for example, in particular what that tells you, if you look at the central value of the scalar field, now in logarithmic time, it's, it, it exhibits this, this echoing structure. And so one thing we do, so, I mean, you, we looked at sort of perturbations of spherical uh, of space times, and it seemed to to work out. So we thought we'd we'd sort of do something which would clearly and obviously break universality. It could it could not possibly have the same threshold solution, and that is choose initial data now in axisymmetry, which is anti-symmetric about a plane through the origin. So in cylindrical coordinates, we have z and rho. If we choose initial data that's anti-symmetric about z equals zero then this possibly can't possibly have the same solution because that's an exact symmetry of the equations. It's going to be preserved for all time. And that implies that the value of the field has to be zero at the origin. You know, oh, sorry, I missed the minus sign. So phi of z is equal to minus phi of minus z. So it's anti-symmetric about the origin. And the only way that that can be satisfied at the origin is zero for all time. So we thought, OK, that has to break this universality. There must be something else that happens. And so this is the simulation. So again. And incidentally, you know, because it's the gradients of the scalar field that, gravi that gravitate, just because the value of the field is zero there doesn't mean there's no energy density. In particular, if there's a slope to the field, there's going to be energy. So you can still focus um, energy with this profile down to, to the, the origin. So this is a, a simulation, again, tuned to within one part in 10 to the 15 of threshold. So again, if we have a very massive distribution of this profile, a big black hole is going to form. And if it's very weak, it's going to disperse. So again, yeah, this is the, the z-axis. This is z equals 0. So in this, in this color scale, green is 0. So this, this, this line here always has to remain green. But they, so interestingly, nature is cleverer than <laughs> we are. And this is what happens. So I'll play it again. But essentially what's happening is, yeah, that symmetry is being preserved exactly. But what happens as you tune to threshold is you get two locally spherically symmetric critical solutions that develop on either side of it. So yeah, in some sense, that at large scales, you get a single black hole. But as you start to uncover the, 
get close to threshold, you locally get a spherically symmetric solution. And I'll, I'll play it again, because then again, you can, um, what happens is, so you can sort of see the echoing happen, and again, in the last, so here I'm slowing down time, but still the echoes are happening here on scales that you can't see. Now, I, I can show you an animation sort of in that same logarithmic tile stuff, because here, this point is actually moving in the domain. We, we could have done the coordinate transformation, it would have been very tricky, but what I'll just do is take this last snapshot and transform to logarithmic coordinates. So I'm gonna go around this point, and you can see you get exactly the same echoing solution about that point. This is where z equals zero was, and this is where the other echoing solution was. So it's just um, distorted in these coordinates, but locally, you do get the same echoing solution. Um, this, this was double precision. So like, it's, I've, like I've tuned things to one part in 10 to the 15. That was as far as I could go with, uh, with double precision, yeah. So, and so now just to show you, to get back to the last few minutes, to the, the numerics, to show you the, 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 the mesh refinement structure. So now going back to the code coordinates, this is that last time frame. And again, th this, this thing took about two days on a, on a, it's a serial code, it's not parallel, so two days on a PC. And at, by this time, it had developed 25 levels of two to one refinement. And so now I'm just gonna, so this is the, the coarsest level and I'm just gonna zoom into that finest level. And incidentally, the, the mesh that's shown here is I think four to one coarsen from what it was in the simulation, but just, if I drew it at the actual mesh scale, it would be a bit of a mess, just you can see the mesh spacing. So now we're gonna zoom in on this leftmost echoing solution. Um, so magnification times two to 32, 500, 16,000, half a million. And we get to the finest level in the hierarchy. So you can see why I say like, this is sort of a poster child for this Bergen Olga style mesh refinement, because you get this incredibly small length scale feature, but it's not volume filling, it's just at that point. Um, so it's really sort of a spectacular example of how well mesh refinement works. But if we were to continue the simulation, it would also be a spectacular example of when it fails. Because as I mentioned before, you've got all those waves that are propagating outwards. In particular, this is a small length scale feature, which is now, so the, ec, the critical solution is done. This case actually doesn't form a black hole, it's subcritical, and this is now gonna propagate outwards. But you're gonna have to, if you wanted to actually follow those waves going outwards, the, the refinement's gonna try to track these waves. And so it, even though it, it took, say, two days to get down to this point, if you wanted to follow these expanding waves until they left the grid, it would be a few decade simulation. So at that point, these are now gonna become volume filling features and the algorithm is gonna break down. So we could sort of get to this point, but not a step further. Um, and that's perhaps also similar to sort of like the, the first star simulations that, 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 that Mike does, you know, when you, when gravitational collapse happens, you know, you can very efficiently get to that point, but then things start to happen and um, you get scales that you can't resolve adequately. Okay, so just in the last couple of minutes, I'm just gonna very briefly describe this <coughs> PAMR, AMRD infrastructure, and I'll probably give an example on, on uh, Friday. So, so, the, so, the, so this, this was sort of the, the, this library um, so the, the, this, this bergen olger algorithm and everything, that was sort of developed to study this, this critical phenomena. It was a serial code, um, but then I knew you know, for, to go to three-dimensional situations, it would have to be in parallel. So that's sort of based on the, the technology for the, this axisymmetric code, um, sort of designed this, this, this library um, and sort of separated it up into a couple of logically distinct components. So this, this PAMR is, is parallel adaptive mesh refinement. But the only task for this, of what this library does is it takes a hierarchy, so a bergen oliger style hierarchy, and distributes it in a parallel environment. Um, so that, that's all it does. It doesn't care about solving equations. It doesn't care about time stepping. You give this hierarchy, you've got a cluster, and it distributes it on that cluster. Then this AMRD for adaptive mesh refinement driver sort of plugs into this PAMR infrastructure and it implements this bergen olger style uh, recursive evolution scheme. Um, but it doesn't care at all about parallelization. It, re it relies completely on this PAMR to do that. And it also doesn't care what equations you want to solve. And that's again because of this, 
there's this very nice feature of the Berglund algorithm that you evolve these series of unigrid uh, time steps. It doesn't have to know what equations you're solving or, or how you're going to solve them. So you get this sort of very nice logical separation of the various tasks. Parallelization is handled separately and independently of the, 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 the equations. This mesh refinement um, doesn't need to know how parallelization happens. It also doesn't care about what your, your code is doing. And from a user's point of view, then you sort of, you sort of plug into the AMRD level of things. So you don't have to worry about details of the mesh refinement, uh, for example, interpolation or setting boundary conditions, etc. And neither do you have to worry about parallelization. Um, so th that was sort of the logical reason for this, this particular, for doing it in this particular fashion. Um, and again, as, as all of you know, I mean, there are dozens of different mesh refinement libraries out there, sort of at the time. And the, the one, in particular, the one, so I, I looked at a whole bunch of the, the, the existing you know, libraries, Paramesh, Trombo, et cetera, that were out there at the time. Um, and the one thing that none of them seemed to be able to do was in, in how to incorporate elliptics into this algorithm. It didn't seem like it would be easy to modify them to do that. Um, so in some sense, I think that, it's just going back to sort of like coding practices. Do you write your own code? Do you, do you not? You know, how much time do you want to spend coding versus doing science? It's, I think it, it always makes sense to first see what's out there. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think I did it, at least at that time, a sufficient survey to see that it wouldn't, I'd spend more try and time trying to you know, fix existing libraries to do what I want to do rather than write something from the scratch. And it probably went, if you ever get to that situation, you'll sort of, um, it, it, it's, it's worth it to spend a little while really thinking carefully about this stuff. Um, so in the end, I decided to write these libraries, and prime, that was the primary reason. So even though I'll sort of show you the binary black hole evolution stuff, that doesn't really use coupled elliptic hyperbolics, but at least the infrastructure is there for, for these kinds of problems. Um, so th again, because of the sort of separation of the, of the tasks, the, the, the interface is relatively simple. It's not necessarily the... the the best uh, written one, but at least at the logical level, it's quite simple. And for example, PMR, all it cares about is distributing grids. And essentially, it's, so it's got a, a whole bunch of more APIs than I've listed here for, uh, for data structure management. So it's taking care of the data structure. And so, for example, it's got APIs that say, well, give me the, you know, this array. Tell me what its dimensions are. Tell me what the coordinates are, et cetera. But the, really, the, it's got only four, four really key functions. And those are the kinds of communication functions you might want with this kind of to, uh, hierarchy. That's what you compose the hierarchy. So given some uh, serial hierarchy, um, it will then take that and distribute it in parallel. And that's also, this is the same as the regrid function. So when you change the hierarchy, you call the same thing. And then there's sort of three kinds of communications that you typically do. You synchronize within a given level, so the ghost regions, the overlap regions. You inject, you know, fine to coarse injection, and you interpolate coarse to fine interpolation. So those are really the only things that it knows how to do. Um, and then the, the AMRD algorithm, again, it, so it uses this PMR infrastructure, it implements this Bergen algorithm. It also includes a sort of a, a, a full approximation storage multigrid driver if you want to solve elliptics. Um, so it uses the, these PMR functions and the way that it, um, you link it into your user code is by a set of hook functions. And I'll, I've, I'm not gonna, we've only got five minutes left there, so I'll show you an example on, um, on Friday. But so, so it, essentially it's got the algorithmic, the pseudocode loop for this burger and auger algorithm. It does everything that it can that has nothing to do with the equations, but at the point where you need to know what the equations are, so in other words, take one time step on the unigrid level, it just calls a user function that then does that. So, it, so it sort of implemented all of the, the computational aspects of the algorithm, the numerical aspects, then you feed into these hook functions. And I should mention that, um, so Branson Stevens is a postdoc at the PCS, and so we've been, um, the last year or two, we've been working uh, quite hard to get um, sort of Berger, Colella, and uh, high conservative hydrodynamics worked into this library, and I think it's pretty much done, and it's mostly been Branson's effort. Um, so at this stage, the version that's sort of available, if you want to you know, go to the web and download it, it's, it's entirely uses vertex-centered grid. So, you know, you can solve, if, you can, if your hydro scheme works on vertex-centered structures, you can use it for hydro. 
But if you want um, one of these good enough methods with flux, um, with con conser conservation, um, and to preserve conservation at the refinement boundaries, you have to change the algorithm. So we've been working on that, and that should be available pretty soon, I think. Um, yeah, so this, this was just my last slide, and just a few random remarks that I <laughs> uh, threw up here. Um, perhaps just the, the, the one point. Um, another thing why, so I, I mentioned, you know, at this stage I looked at some of the, the existing libraries, um, and some of them are incredibly complicated. You know, not complicated, but they're very, they feature-laden. They can do tremendous amounts of things, and if, you, and if for some of them, you know, the source code's available, and it's hundreds of thousands of lines of source code. And so you think, well, how can you, you know, at that stage decide you want to write your own library? I mean, that's completely impractical um, to, to reproduce that in any kind of reasonable time. However, for the, for the Einstein equations, again, for the, the, because they are so expensive to solve at a computationally, at a particular grid point, there's certain things that you can do that really simplify things a lot. Um, and that was, I think, one of the main issues why I decided it would be feasible to write this, this code. And in particular, this, this issue of lo locality, having to have um, and, you know, some of the complicated strategies that people have devised for load balancing, you know, getting efficient distribution of meshes, perhaps working in you know, inhomogeneous environments. That wasn't really an issue here. And so you could get away with a relatively simple kind of hierarchy, this, this sort of box-in-box -box hierarchy, and a relatively simple load balancing distribution strategy. And also, didn't have to be very careful about some of the, you know, optimally writing, you know, regridding routines or interpolation routines, because essentially, if you look at the costs, they're for free compared to how costly it is to solve the Einstein equations. And then another comment, and this is probably not, not so much for the astrophysics community, but I think especially the, the GR community, um, there is a bit of a, um, sort of an old wives' tale floating around that elliptic equations are too expensive to solve. Um, and it's essentially, if your pro uh, problem involves an elliptic equation, it's a, it's a, it's a project killer. But as you mentioned, that, that there are techniques that solve elliptic equations very efficiently and almost as efficiently as any hyperbolic equation, in particular multigrid. And just in this example, sort of a, with a, the axisymmetric collapse code, so that's, that, that is similar to the, the spherically symmetric example that, that we did for, that I gave for the homework. Um, and in that case, um, you can also do free versus constrained, but they're on the order of three to four hyperbolic equations and three to four elliptic that you, equations that you solve at every single time step. And if you do, this was sort of like a code profiling, and the, it changes a little bit as, as things go along. But typically, um, solving in roughly the same amount of elliptic equations only takes about twice as much time as solving the same amount of hyperbolic equations. And the, the time spent on mesh refinement stuff is, is sort of, I mean, if you could optimize this, if you spend all your time and let this time go to zero in this code, you'd only save five to 10% of runtime. So, Elliptic equations should not be avoided. They should perhaps be embraced, and if they're there, just solve them. And there are algorithms, in particular multigrid is just as good as any kind of um, implicit time stepper for uh, hyperbolic equations. Okay, thanks. <laughs>